So thanks again to Alexi for inviting me to speak. Um, and I'll just say uh, thank you also because since I'm early in my career, it's really nice to have these opportunities. I find that I learn a lot when I give talks, maybe more than people learn from my talks, but um, it's a good opportunity for me. And it's also a nice way to meet the faces behind the names that I see on all these papers I read. So it's fun to speak in the seminar, especially because they're uh, great papers that I've read and I get to you know, talk to you about things. So um, like Alexi said, I'm gonna be talking about lifts, transfers, and degrees. Um, and the kind of the story that I wanna tell relates to, so the A1 degree, which is the Matific analog of the Brouwer degree. And there's this idea that I'll explain that uh, in the classical setting, since you're working over the real numbers in like classical homotopy theory, they're not really interesting field extensions to worry about. You might like worry about the complexification of things, but really there's not too much going on in terms of changing my base field. Um, but in Matific homotopy theory, we're gonna be able to have flexibility with the base field over which we work. And so you can start to ask, well, what happens? Uh, like, are my constructions nice with respect to changing the base? Um, and one thing that's interesting is we know some things about how the A1 degree behaves under uh, base change and um, how to uh, work in a kind of a computable, tractable way uh, as you change the base. But there are some things that we don't really understand how to do yet. Um, and it feels like we should know how to do these things. So that's kind of the, the story I wanna tell is there are some questions that I don't have answers to that I think we should have answers to. Um, and partway through, I'll take a little uh, brief detour through uh, enumerative geometry and maybe give some motivation for why would you care to be able to worry about your base field at all. So that's the general story. So the quick recap is that the Brouwer degree is a way of taking homotopy classes of uh, self maps of the sphere. And in like a first algebraic topology course, you would prove that this is isomorphic to the integers and the Brouwer degree is just this isomorphism. So I give you a, an endomorphism of the sphere and then you assign to that an integer. In the case of just a circle, it's the winding number. It's got a very nice visual construction and it's, uh, to, in my mind, it's one of the first places where you really see like an algebraic classification of topological information. So it's a nice basic construction that we uh, know and love as topologists. Um, and then the A1 degree is just the uh, version of the Brouwer degree, but for Mativic homotopy theory. So instead of SN, we have these Mativic spheres, um, which are the quotients PN over PN minus one. And these were studied by uh, Fabian Morel, and he showed that there's a map from A1 homotopy classes of self maps of the sphere uh, to GWK, which is the growth and Vit ring of quadratic form, like isomorphism classes of symmetric non-degenerate bilinear forms over K. Um, and uh, Morel showed that this is an isomorphism in dimension uh, two and larger, and it's a surjection in uh, dimension one. And then, um, so this is Morel. And then uh, in dimension one, we even have better understanding of like the extra information that Morel's A1 degree is missing. Um, and this is due to Morel and Kazanov. Um, so there's more that you can say about the degree map in dimension one. Um, and I'll have a brief remark about dimension one a little bit later, but it's, um, we'll mostly just focus on the A1 degree, thinking about it stably, so as a map to GWK. Um, and I think it's a nice piece of uh, the, like, the history of the subject that the A1 degree is not just like an analog of the Brouwer degree, but it's really a true generalization of the Brouwer degree. And the reason for this is if you take 
a, a map f, and I'm kind of not saying exactly what it's where it's it's living, but if you take a map uh, and look at its rank, uh, the rank of the a1 degree of that map. So the a1 degree itself is a bilinear form. You take the rank of that bilinear form, you get the Brouwer degree of the complexification of f. So assuming that f kind of lives over the right sort of field. And then if you take the signature of this bilinear form of the A1 degree, then you get the Brouwer degree of F as a map in the real setting. So um, this is due to, um, and I'll probably say the names later, but um, the rank part is due to Palomotov, uh, and the signature part is due to Eisenbud Levine and Kim Shiashvili independently. So uh, Eisenbud Levine have this annals paper about uh, an algebraic formula for the Brouwer degree of a C infinity map germ. And Kim Shiashvili in the same year had an independent uh, publication of the same thing in uh, a different journal. And so it's one of those fun examples of a very famous paper uh, being kind of simultaneous with a less famous paper, but they're the same result. So it just kind of shows the way that these things play out sometimes. Um, and uh, these two results also kind of go through Jesse Cass and Kirsten Wickelgren's uh, proof that you can compute the Brouwer degree or the, the A1 degree using uh, Eisenbud Levine and Kim Shiashvili's formula for the Brouwer degree. So there's kind of a connection to all of these things, but it really shows that this motivic homotopy theory we're doing, it's not just like similar to the topological story, but it really is generalizing it in some sense. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning, the question we wanna ask is, so how does the A1 degree behave under field extensions? This is not something we really had to worry about in the classical setting, because you could maybe take the complexification, but beyond that, there's not much to do. So the general outline for the talk is I'm gonna give just a quick background on the A1 degree, how it's defined. We're really gonna be focusing on a local version. So the local A1 degree, just like you have the local Brouwer degree uh, in classical topology. So we'll go through those definitions and then I'm gonna kind of give motivation for the main question by talking a little bit about enumerative geometry. And then we'll come back and I'll do a review of uh, transfers in motivic homotopy theory. Not the, there's a, a very big story there and I'm just gonna focus on a small uh, algebraic side of the story that's in Morel's book, uh, A1 Algebraic Topology. Um, and then at the very end, I'll talk kind of about the, the idea, the question and a couple theorems about how do we lift morphism so that we can compute uh, under field extensions. Okay, so the uh, local A1 degree, I'm going to take a map of schemes from, so from X to Y, and it's going to send a point P to a rational point FP. So I'm thinking about X and Y as living over some field K. Um, and from this, I can build an induced map, which goes from so I take an open neighborhood uh, of P and I'm gonna look in this kind of quotient ball neighborhood. Uh, and I'm gonna to map to this quotient neighborhood of, so V is some neighborhood of the image point F of P. And if you take the right kind of neighborhood, you can make these quotients look like uh, affine space quotiented out by punctured affine space. And the motivic world, this is supposed to look exactly like the local construction classically where you take, uh, so if you've got a map of manifolds and you've got a point mapping to another point, you look at a, a ball around your points and you just take uh, like that ball quotiented by the punctured ball and it just gives you the boundary. And this looks like a sphere living around your point. This is how we build the local degree classically. You build these spheres around your points and you study this induced map on those, uh, those spheres that you build. So that's all we're doing here is the motivic story of this. 
And since we've assumed that the, that the image point FP is rational, um, we can choose this neighborhood to uh, land at zero because zero is nice and k-rational. Must be a closer point. Yeah, P is a close point. Okay. Yeah, I uh, I think there are uh, some people have started thinking about uh, like taking the local degree at like a generic point, but the paper that I think this is in has not appeared yet, and it's been in progress for uh, like three or four years. So I'm still waiting for this paper to appear. Uh, I won't say who's writing it, but um, okay. Yeah. But yeah, so we'll take P to be closed. Mm -hmm. And uh, F of P, K rational. So then this doesn't quite look like a map of spheres yet, unless you know the story. So let's just kind of describe the story. Um, there's a purity isomorphism for the sphere on the right, which lets us write this. Uh, sorry, uh, what, what kind of assumptions do you have on F? On F, um, we'll assume that F is uh, has an isolated zero, so like uh, okay, yeah. E an isolated zero. Yeah, and by zero you mean that, or like yeah, it's isolated, isolated free image of, of yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe I should say P isolated in the fiber. Yeah. Right. Yeah, these are just things to make sure that you can actually do this construction. So the purity isomorphism lets us rewrite this quotient as a sphere over K. Um, I won't say that this is purity, this kind of excision. Also, I mean, purity is uh, some kind of deformation to the normal bundle. And this is, I mean, this isomorphism is usually so that you say that Pn minus one, you can up to homotopy enlarge it to the complement of a point. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, complement of a point in Pn is O of one over Pn minus one. Yeah, so so maybe I'm skipping a step. Maybe this is uh, this is excision and purity, right? So this is uh, excision to write this as Pn over Pn minus zero, and then it's purity to write it as Pn uh, over Pn minus no, one. I mean, it's not purity. Okay. Um, I mean, it is a kind of a thing when, say, if you want to collapse in, uh, I mean, if you want to collapse a line somewhere, it is the same as to collapse a point of this line, right? Because line and point are homotopy equivalent. Mm -hmm. it's not, it is not purity, it is just homotopy equivalence of something. I mean, it is a simple homotopy equivalence, it is not deformation to normal cone or something like that. Yeah, maybe. Well, yeah, but okay. Any, anyhow, it is true. So yeah, no problem. We'll just put quotes on it and move on. Um, so the, the difficulty, so however we name this, we were able to do this kind of easily enough because this is a k-rational point. When this is not k-rational, we can't uh, write this necessarily as pn over k mod pn minus one over k. We have this kind of difficulty of the like the field of definition of p. And so the solution is to use excision to look at this in projective space um, and then use the collapse map. So the collapse map is uh, crushing kind of where where you've pulled out your p crushing map uh, piece and uh, or I guess you can think of it kind of as pn minus one including into this pn minus p. And so we define the local degree uh, at p as this big composite. So we need to take a degree we need spheres on either end of our map and you start by applying the collapse map. And then we have our excision allowing us to write this as uh, u over u minus p. F induces a map 
here. And then whether it's uh, purity or excision or some other name, we end up at our uh, projective or our sphere over here. And we just define the local A1 degree to be the A1 degree of this composite. So this is not uh, new. This goes back to at least uh, Cass and Wilkogren's paper and probably even, uh, I, I haven't seen it earlier than that, but I imagine that it was uh, already in the literature at that point. So this is something that people have thought about for uh, at least a few years. Um, so that's the local degree. I mentioned earlier that uh, in dimension one, uh, Kazanov gives us a way to understand the A1 degree, so not necessarily the local degree, but the A1 degree um, with the extra information. So a formula for this is given by something called the Bayesian determinant or the Bayesian uh, and its determinant. So <clears throat> the Bayesian is a polynomial that you can uh, associate to a rational function on here. Um, and then you can build a bilinear form out of its coefficients. And then if you take the determinant of this bilinear form, you get something living in K star and Kazanov proves that this extra information from the, the A1, un, uh, A1 degree unstably, so in dimension one, is precisely the determinant. So it's a, a nice result of Kazanov um, in the global case. So I would think of this as like global A1 degree dimension one. And then I mentioned earlier, Cass and Wickelgren proved that, uh, so if you have your point P being K rational, or if your function F is a tall at P, then you can use this form of Eisenbud, Levine and Kim uh, And there's, it goes back to some commutative algebra of Shea and Storch where they, uh, they construct kind of an explicit version of coherent duality on uh, some local algebra. And there's a, a nice story there algebraically that Eisenbud, Levine, and Kim Shashvili exploit to build this bilinear form. And Cass and Wickelgren say that if you take the isomorphism class, that's actually equal to the, the local A1 degree in the setting. So this is the local A1 degree. And you've got some. Uh, some assumptions on your base point. So on P. And then uh, kind of building on this in joint work with Thomas Braselton, Robert Berkland, Michael Montero, and Morgan Opie, uh, we look at Cass and Wickelgren's result and we say, well, if the field extension, uh, so the field of definition of your point, if that's separable over the base, then you can compute the local A1 degree at that point by we base change. So you look at the base change of your morphism to be uh, defined over the field of definition of your point. You take the local A1 degree at the rational lift of your point P. So P is uh, defined over some field and uh, you look at a representative of it upstairs, which is kind of given to you by your choice of field extension coming from this point. So you now compute this uh, local A1 degree. It lives in GW of the residue field K of P. And so to get back down to your base field, you take the field trace. So that's what this story does here. It just says the you can compute the local A1 degree essentially the same way as Cass and Wickelgren describe. Uh, when you have a separable point, you just base change, compute using their formula rationally, and then field trace back down. And I'll, uh, I'll mention the proof uh, in, a, in a little bit because this is kind of the motivating idea that so for separable field extensions, we know how to understand uh, how the local A1 degree behaves under such extensions. We, we know that if I wanna compute this guy, well, I change this morphism a little bit by base changing it. And then I recover uh, by 
taking the field trace, which comes from a transfer, comes from the cohomological transfer. And I'd like to be able to do that in any setting. And so I'll talk about why you can't just uh, apply the same thing uh, in any setting, and so why we need to look for an alternative. Um, but the next result I'll mention, and I think Sabrina Pauli talked about this last year in your seminar, but um, we showed that both the, the global degree and the local degree are uh, computable in terms of the multivariate Bayesian. So this looks like uh, kind of a generalization of what Kazanov uses, um, but we also show how to use this in the local case. There are no assumptions on the base field in the local case, like on the field of definition of P in the local case. So this gives you uh, essentially, there's an algebraic formula in any setting you would want to compute. If you want to compute a local degree or a global degree, there's some algebra that you can just apply and it will give you your bilinear form uh, or it will give you a bilinear form. You take the isomorphism class, and that is the degree you are looking for. Um, and we uh, even wrote this up in code. So there's some uh, code on uh, my GitHub if you're interested in doing computations. Um, we've got something that will do this computation for you. Um, and the reason I wanted to mention this result is. So we can always compute the degree. And so the question that I'm asking about how does the local or global degree behave under field extensions, this is no longer uh, an important question in terms of being able to compute things. We need kind of a different motivation for the question, right? We, uh, the question arose originally because we wanted to be able to take the local degree when I had like a purely inseparable residue field and I wanted to be able to make sense of this. Um, but now that we have a formula that can handle that, there's maybe a different reason that we're looking for an answer to this question. So, so a question about uh, the case of separable ex extension. Mm -hmm. So when, when you base change uh, your, your point splits, right, into mm -hmm. several many copies, and this uh, trace somehow, uh, I mean, it somehow sums, uh, uh, sums the degree for this points, right? Uh, it is not the case. Yeah, so so it's, it's, uh, it's so yeah, the, the point splits and the idea is you just choose one of the pre-images of your point. Yeah. It doesn't matter which one you choose, like the, in, in some sense, the pre-image is chosen for you by how you write down your field extension. But yeah. uh, regardless of which point you choose, when you're, uh, when you're looking at this base change, um, the the way the computation works. So the um, the way the computation works for this is this map is going to have an isolated zero at p tilde, um, and so somehow the local degree is going to not see any of the information from the other lifts uh, mm -hmm. of p. It's only going to see this information. Um, but then when we take the field trace, it essentially is, uh, in some sense, that bilinear form is recovering like the other lists. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's not quite a, so, right? So you uh, like, you have your bilinear form and it goes like this, and then you take your field trace, right. it comes down. So it's it's not like literally summing over the the other lifts, but the um, the bilinear form you write down does see that information. That's okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm not uh, answering the question. No, no, it's okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, but thank you for the questions, and please. Uh, the reason I learn so much in giving talks is because people ask me great questions, and sometimes I have no idea what the answer is. So it's good for me to learn that way. Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, the question is, uh, in some sense, can we always write the local A1 degree by base changing to the rational case, so working rationally, um, and then taking a, we'll see that a field trace in general is not going to work. Um, and so we could ask, is there some 
other like algebraic transfer on growth and equivalent groups that I can use to compute rationally and then push back down to my field where I care about it and get the answer. And we'll uh, see that the base change is just not going to work in general. Um, so we need something a little bit better. And we have an idea for how to do this in dimension one and no idea how to do this in higher dimensions. So that's going to be the big question. Yeah, but in general, if your field, I mean, if your extension is inseparable, you, you, you get nilpotence and all that stuff. Yeah, it's the, the, the nilpotence cause problems is yeah. uh, the, the general idea. I mean, every, I, everything starts with from smooth varieties, right? And I mean, all the whole theory is mostly for smooth varieties. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, but there's there's a in some sense, like in some sense, you can still hope to uh, avoid those nil potents. The the base change is just not going to do it. So I, you're kind mm -hmm. of guessing the punchline about why this is not going to work is. Uh, pick your favorite inseparable extension, which is probably coming from FP adjoined T, like parenthesis T. Yeah. Uh, and when you do this, if you do like the local computation, you get like very visibly nilpotents that the local construction normally would ignore because they're not uh, like, well, I'll, I'll describe this a little bit later, but the idea is when you do the local construction, you localize and any factors of your morphism that uh, are no, no longer relevant when they're invertible, you can ignore those and it kind of reduces the rank of this local algebra. And that's going to reduce the rank of the bilinear form you work with. But for this purely inseparable example that I'll mention, somehow the rank doesn't drop when you localize. And so then when you apply a transfer, it increases the rank and you end up with a rank higher than you wanted to end up with. And so that's how you can kind of see that uh, base change or like uh, field uh, change is just not going to work for us. So we will uh, get to that in a little bit. But first, so I mentioned like we have these formulas to compute in uh, like any generality you would care about for now. Um, so we need a different reason for like, why is this question still an interesting one to ask? And the story is coming from something that I love to think about, which is enumerative geometry over non-closed fields. So you've uh, maybe seen talks about this sort of thing where we're gonna take a question in enumerative geometry, apply uh, these tools from Mativic homotopy theory and get a bilinear form valued count. And then we can use uh, invariance of the base field or of the bilinear forms over the base field to recover classical counts. So we'll get some bilinear form valued count whose rank is a classical count we recognize, whose signature is maybe a count from real algebraic geometry, and whose discriminant tells you something about finite fields, or whose Haas and Witt invariants tell you something about enumerative geometry over Q. So it's a cool story to me. Um, and the way that we attack it is using. Uh, kind of the vector bundle approach to enumerative geometry. We're going to have uh, a parameter space X, and this space represents the objects that we want to count in enumerative geometry. And then we've got a vector bundle V that in some sense is representing the geometric conditions I want to impose on the things that I want to count. So I'll give some examples of this in a little bit. Um, and then the way that you like kind of the general procedure for proving theorems in this world is you uh, take an Euler number of your vector bundle, and this is in the A1 setting, so you get a growth and value valued uh, Euler number, and you express it in terms of a Poincaré Hopf theorem. So you look at this as a sum of local indices of sigma, where sigma is a suitably nice section of your vector bundle. And sigma in some sense represents like a specific uh, incarnation of the enumerative problem you're thinking about. So for 27 lines on a cubic surface, this is going to be a parameter space of lines in uh, projective space. It's gonna be a Grassmannian. This is going to be uh, a vector bundle that imposes the condition that your lines lie on a cubic surface. 
and sigma is going to represent a specific cubic surface that you care about. Um, and so the way that this theorem works is uh, the Euler number is fixed over any section. It does not depend on your section. And so it says, well, for any cubic surface that I chose, I'm getting this fixed count. But this local information does depend on my cubic surface. And it also depends on the uh, elements of the parameter space at which I'm looking. It's going to depend both on the cubic surface and the lines that I'm counting. So this is like the general idea behind how we're thinking about enumerative geometry. Um, and the local information is really what is kind of the motivating question for this talk. Um, so there are lots of great papers and great theorems on how do I compute Euler numbers in classical topology, in uh, like A1 algebraic topology. Um, a lot of really interesting results have kind of come from people trying to give new ways of thinking about computing these Euler numbers. Uh, in some sense, this so this local data is going to come from a local A1 degree. And because of the formulas I mentioned earlier, we have a really good handle on how to compute this. The main difficulty in computing is like setting up the problem correctly. And once you've set it up, we have formulas to just compute the local degree. But what we don't know really how to do very well is interpret those local degrees. You get some crazy formula for some element of the growth and Vick group. And in order for this to be a nice enumerative geometric theorem, you want to be able to describe whatever this local data is, not in terms of a big algebraic formula, but in terms of the geometry that we care about. So I'm, if I'm counting lines on a cubic surface, I want to say something about, given a line on a cubic surface, what geometric information uh, should be relevant in how I count this line. Um, classically, you count things with multiplicity. So I just say, like, what is the multiplicity of this line? In real enumerative geometry, you count uh, uh, according to uh, maybe like a Velshinger invariant or something that's telling you, like, is it a plus or minus line? Is it a positively oriented or a negatively oriented sign uh, line? That's kind of the, the idea that we want to emulate. And do this very generally, we'd like to very generally say, like, what is the geometric way for me to think about this local data? So I'll talk about that in a second. Um, some examples of this uh, enumerative program. So Jesse Cass and Christian Wickelgren did this for lines on cubic surfaces. And the bundle looks like uh, it's a symmetric bundle uh, living over a Grassmannian of projective lines and projective three space. Sabrina Pauli uh, did a re related problem uh, on lines on a quintic threefold. So the bundle looks very similar. The section, sections look very similar as well. And uh, you go through the process uh, and you kind of, you get an Euler number and then you ask, what can I say about the local data? Which I'll talk about very briefly in a second. Um, for a different flavor of problem, I. Uh, looked at Bezu's theorem in this setting. And so it looks like, uh, well, I'm looking at projective space and then uh, this bundle of O of Ds living over that. Uh, sections here look like tuples of homogeneous polynomials. So it looks like collections of hypersurfaces cut out by those polynomials. Um, so this is why that's kind of the right bundle to think about for Bayesian's theorem. And then something that I did in my thesis and I'm currently writing up in a little bit more generality is, so the circles of Apollonius, which I think is a really fun classical uh, theorem is that you've got, if I've got three circles in the plane and I ask how many uh, other circles are simultaneously tangent to all three, you get eight circles. Um, and one way to think about this is a literal uh, special case of Bezu's theorem, because the parameter space of circles in the plane, you can prove to be a P3. And the parameter space of circles tangent to a given circle happens to be a quadratic cone. That's a degree two cone. And so you get three copies of O of two. And Bezu's theorem tells you that you have two times two times two 
circles of Apollonius. Um, so in some sense, classically, this is just a, a special case of Bezu's theorem and something that is arising from thinking about the local data is that in the A1 enumerative setting, this is not just a special case anymore. There's some extra information we have to worry about. Um, so let me explain that. The local data for lines on cubic surfaces, um, it's phrased in terms of something called the Segre involution. So over the real numbers, lines on cubic surfaces come in two flavors. They come in hyperbolic or elliptic flavors. Uh, and you can see this visually by, if you follow the tangent plane of your cubic surface as you go along one of those lines, it's either going to wobble back and forth but never make a full spin, or it's gonna make a full rotation. Um, if you find the, like various pictures of real cubic surfaces, then they're like actual lines you can follow along and see this visually. Um, and you can phrase this in terms of another geometric construction called the Segre involution, which I won't define here. But I mention it because uh, for lines on quintic threefolds, um, it turns out that the local data is given by a product of three Segre involutions. So in some sense, this is a, a like a suggestion to me that there should be kind of a family of enumerative problems that you can relate to each other by their local data. So in, in the sense that lines on these hypersurfaces, they look like they have very similar local geometric data in terms of Segre involutions. Um, and something that becomes a little difficult is uh, asking, well, can you do this in general? Could I say for any line on hypersurface type problem, am I always getting the same sort of geometric way of thinking about the local data. Um, so then Bezu's theorem, the local data is given in terms of something called an intersection volume. You, uh, if you have smooth hypersurfaces that meet transversely at a point, you look at their gradient directions. This gradient is determined by the presentation of, that, of the hypersurfaces. So the polynomial that you chose to um, cut out that hypersurface these gradient directions will uh, give you the legs of a parallel pipette. And then you just look at the volume of that parallel pipette. And you can use this to actually uh, understand the local data. So that's kind of a geometric construction. The rank of this is the intersection multiplicity in some sense. Uh, the signature tells you whether they're meeting in like a positively or negatively oriented way. And so you'd like to say that it's the same thing for the circles of Apollonius. Um, but when you do that, what you're getting is an intersection volume, not on the circles themselves, but on this mo these moduli spaces that I was mentioning, right? So this is, uh, this looks like cones meeting in, uh, somehow it's like, you're not actually seeing the circles themselves, but cones in the parameter space. And so if I tried to apply this description to the circles of Apollonius, Somehow it's not actually telling me local data about the circles, but local data about the parameter space. Um, so that's not the right way to count things. Uh, and I don't have like a, a good definition of what the right way is. Um, but if you do a little bit more work, you can prove that there's a way to count these circles of Apollonius using a formula that involves uh, the distances between the centers of your circles and the tangency directions. So you can talk about whether your circles meet uh, internally or externally, which is done classically over the real numbers. And we get some sort of formula for this uh, in general. And what I'm currently working on is a conjecture that you can actually simplify this local data picture and just phrase things in terms of tangency directions. So all of the things I'm saying right now are very hand wavy and vague because it's uh, not a technical discussion of these things, but motivation that this is a family of problems that I think is very interesting. And there's, uh, in general, I think this interesting question of geometricity, which is, uh, can you always phrase the local data of these enumerative problems in terms of the geometry? 
uh, geometric. And if you want to go further, can you always classify these enumerative problems by their local data type? So as I mentioned with like lines on hypersurfaces, it looks like you should be able to do that. Um, it looks like lines on hypersurfaces belong to the same sort of family. Um, Cass, or not Cass, uh, Christian Wickelgren and Padma Srinivasan have a paper on um, counting uh, hyperplanes meeting uh, other hyperplanes. So it, it's like a generalization of the how many lines are there through four lines in P3 problem. Um, and they give a general description of the local data that holds for this whole family. So they do, in a sense, they answer this question for this family of problems uh, when it's a question of hyperplanes meeting other hyperplanes subject to some configuration. Um, and uh, in some ongoing work with Sabrina Pauli, uh, we show that for uh, plane curves meeting lines in projective space, you should kind of get another family of local data that is closely related to each other. So um, to me, this question is, uh, it's, it's one of those things that is still very uh, hazy. It's not really clear what the question exactly needs to be and what the end goal needs to be, but it's kind of a, an idea that's forming in my head of something that I think is interesting to study. Um, May I ask a I'll... question about this? Yes, please do, please. Yeah, uh, in this examples, uh, when you count lines, uh, is it the case that this local data is given by a rank one quadratic form? Um, in, so counting lines on hypersurfaces? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, for uh, cubic surfaces, it's uh, a part of the theory that those are always uh, simple lines. They're never higher uh, weight lines. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you do always get rank one forms. Um, mm -hmm. and like I, so when I describe the intersection volume here, there is a, this is, um, assuming that your hypersurfaces meet transversely, which gives you that the intersection multiplicity is one, which gives you that the, uh, rank of the local index is one. So you get a rank one form here. Mm -hmm. Um, in some sense, we really only know how to describe the local data in these rank one cases. Um, and so there are things that you can try and do to reduce to rank one cases. Um, thinking about it in terms of Bezu's theorem, so something that I was about to say is uh, locally, all of these problems, if you think about it in terms of the parameter space, they all look like uh, Bezu's theorem in some sense. That, so if I take uh, let me find a little space. If I take my uh, bundle V over X, but I'm just looking in like a local neighborhood to do the local computation, this really looks like, uh, like you take a trivialization um, and it starts to look a lot like a map of AN to AN and you're looking at like, uh, so you take a local map and it looks like P mapping to zero. This is like how you build the local dis degree description of the local index. Um, and this starts to very much look like the story uh, that you go through to understand Bezu's theorem. Um, and since transversality is a generic condition, you can do some deformation type stuff. Uh, you, you, there's a dynamic version of the local degree that was uh, first described by Sabrina Pauli and then Pauli Wickelgrim. And then in my thesis, I give a little bit more details on this um, where you can perturb to the transverse case. So in some sense, we can like, from the perspective of Bezu's theorem, we can always uh, reduce to the transverse case, which is then the rank one case. And then we have uh, a nice formula for the local degree um, in terms of the Jacobian, which I'll mention in a second. And this is, to me, where all the geometry is coming from. The geometry is coming from, in the rank one case, you can phrase things in terms of the Jacobian, and the Jacobian is a very geometric construction. So does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
So like I was just describing, uh, so in classical enumerative geometry, you always count using intersection multiplicity. And in some sense, this is uh, because Bayes' theorem is like the, it's like a universal local viewpoint on uh, enumerative geometry. When you look locally at this question of like counting things by looking at sections of vector bundles, um, the way that you count intersection multiplicity uh, or multiplicity of objects in your parameter space comes from intersection multiplicity. Um, so you can also prove this sort of thing in A1 enumerative geometry. So I do this in my thesis. I uh, show that if you wanted to, you could say that Bezu's theorem gives you an answer to the question I was asking earlier about, can you always recognize these problems as uh, locally geometric problems? Like, is the local data always geometric? But the, the geometric information is on the parameter space instead of intrinsic to the objects we care about. So as I was mentioning with circles of Apollonius, I care about the circles. I don't care about the, the cones, actually, like the parameter spaces, which look like cones. Those are less interesting to me. I really care about the like circles in the plane and drawing things tangent to them. And so I would like my geometric data to be in terms of the uh, objects that I'm counting instead of the parameter space. So we want a better answer. And this is kind of a long-winded way to get to why do I want to be able to lift things? So if I reduce to the transverse case or the case where my uh, P is a simple zero, uh, like my section vanishes uh, of order one at P, then I can express that local degree. So if I have a separable extension, then I can base change, take a Jacobian of some polynomial map representing sigma, and then evaluate a P, put this inside brackets, and base change back down to K. And this is really where all the geometry in the cases that I know about comes from. All the cases that I've seen, the way you get a geometric description is you phrase things in terms of the Jacobian, and then you do some hard uh, work on the algebraic geometry side of saying, I've looked at the Jacobian, can I now interpret this in terms of the, uh, not the parameter space, but the, the objects that I'm counting. Um, but there's this pesky assumption on the base field being, uh, or the residue field being separable over the base field. And so I would love to, in uh, greater generality, be able to say that there's some you have a question? No, no. OK. Um, uh, I would love to be able to say that associated to sigma, there's some other map sigma tilde over the residue field such that I can write my local index again in terms of, so maybe it's not the field trace, but some transfer and a Jacobian. So in order to be able to do this, to reduce to the Jacobian case. Um, I, I really need to be able to uh, base change or at least work over the residue field of my point so that I'm working rationally. This uh, Jacobian formula comes from working rationally. I want, uh, I guess this should be like a P tilde. Uh, P tilde over here. I, I would really like to be working rationally so that I can do this. So that's, this is kind of my uh, like non-technical motivation for why is this still an interesting problem? Even if I always have an algebraic formula for local A1 degrees and global A1 degrees, uh, somehow the algebraic formula is really, it's really hard to squeeze geometry out of that. Um, but if I have a formula in terms of the Jacobian, there's kind of some obvious geometry lying around that we can work with to prove these sorts of theorems. Um, and somehow this is where the lifting problem becomes interesting to me. I uh, would like to say that this is the base change, but we're going to see that that's not true in general. And so I wanna say, is there something that I can get a handle on that will allow me to prove this sort of theorem? Um, so 
one thing that goes wrong in uh, for non-separable extensions is, well, the field trace can just vanish uh, for non-separable extensions. And so it could send a non-degenerate form to a degenerate form. So that's maybe, if you haven't seen the story of uh, like these algebraic transfers on growth and equipment groups, this maybe motivates why it's not just good enough to deal with the field trace. We're going to need some more general stuff. So the next step is going to be diving into the story of transfers and, and talking about that. Okay. Are there questions at this point? Anything I can? This is my first time giving an hour and a half talk, and so I uh, have no sense if I'm going to uh, be able to pace myself well. So we'll see. Um, so uh, the story of transfers that I want to tell, I mentioned earlier, comes from Morel's book, A1 Algebraic Topology. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, three transfers, the geometric transfer, the cohomological transfer, and the absolute transfer. And the reason that these are the ones that I want to think about is, so they're uh, like the General theory of transfers is uh, really interesting and there's a lot of geometry and topology going on, but in some sense, I wanna come back to algebra. I wanna be able to have very explicit formulas in the world of bilinear forms that tell me how these transfers behave. And so these three transfers that I'm gonna talk about kind of share a related theme of, I understand what they look like on GW really well. Um, and if anyone knows of other transfers that have really nice descriptions on GW, I would love to hear it. I would especially love to hear if things like the finite flat transfer have uh, really nice descriptions when you're looking at what they do on GW, but I think that's maybe a harder question than it might seem at first. So the geometric transfer is going to be uh, defined using some residue maps. So I'm gonna take a closed point in A1 over my field. And uh, because A1 is one dimensional, this implies that the residue field of P is a finite simple extension of the base field. So I'm gonna take uh, the minimal polynomial of P to be M. Or, well, sorry, the minimal polynomial of a primitive element T of this extension. So this is maybe a little convoluted, but this is a simple extension. So it has a primitive element T. I'm gonna take M to be its uh, minimal polynomial. Uh, this gives me a discrete valuation on the fraction field K of X. And from that, you can get a residue map associated to the point P, which goes from uh, Milner bit K1 of that fraction field down to growth and bit of K of P. I'm not gonna get bogged down into the like uh, technical underpinnings of any of this because it's actually not going to be uh, super relevant. Um, we're going to cite a theorem or a lemma that says, here's what it looks like on GW and that's gonna be good enough for us. But anyway, we get this residue map and then the element minus one over X, this is another, uh, irreducible, uh, well, it's another uh, function that gives us a discrete valuation on k of x, which we call uh, minus partial infinity. And so you again get uh, a residue map from k1 Milner bit. But since uh, this essentially is a, like has a rational point associated to it, infinity is a rational point. Uh, this gives us a map down to GWK. And the very fun insight of Morel is that, so you can define a geometric transfer associated to our primitive element T. So we've got kind of a mess of notation here to keep track of T, um, but I can go down from K of P to GW of K by taking a bilinear form alpha and sending it to minus partial infinity of the pre-image under partial P. And uh, Morel shows that this is independent of your uh, pre-image. So any point you choose in the fiber, uh, 
once you apply uh, this other this minus infinity residue map, uh, this gives you a fixed uh, element associated to alpha. So the, the lemma that makes this really easy to deal with is, so I'm going to take a, a K linear map from my residue field down to the base field K. And what it does to powers of the primitive element is it sends the top power to one. And it kills the other powers. Um, and you, I would call this the Charlau map. And the theorem is that uh, on GW, the uh, geometric transfer associated to T is just pushed forward under the Charlau map. So it's very like explicitly usable. Uh, you can do linear algebra with this sort of map. By push forward, you just mean that you compose your bilinear form with this map. Yeah, exactly. So you just uh, so instead of like earlier, we were taking uh, this map and then mapping under the field trace down to k, and now you just post compose with this. Other questions or things that I can. So there's the geometric transfer. Um, Just a stupid question. And this thing differs from, from the trace, right? I mean, uh, this transfer. Yeah, this transfer is not the same as the trace. Okay. There is some, there, there's some setting where these, uh, these things are going to, so what to say? There is a setting where this geometric transfer is going to agree with the cohomological transfer. Um, but the cohomological transfer on separable extensions is going to give us the field trace. Mm -hmm. So the idea is the geometric transfer looks like the Charlau trace, is what I would call it. Um, the cohomological transfer is going to look like the field trace or the Galois trace. Um, and they're not the same on purely or on uh, separable extensions, but on I think it's purely inseparable extensions, they actually coincide. Um, but in that setting, the cohomological transfer is not the field trace because the field trace is just not the right map there. Um, so go ahead. Okay. Um, so something we notice is uh, in both the de definition of the geometric transfer and also the Charlot map is this dependence on the primitive element. So the story behind the cohomological transfer is I want to remove uh, the dependence on T. I would like my transfer to just be uh, given to me with no dependence on how I wrote down my field extension. So I want to remove dependence on T. So I'm going to set E to be the exponential characteristic of your field K. Um, and this really confused me when I had never seen it defined before. So I always define it when I mention it. It's the same thing as the characteristic, except for in characteristic zero, in which case you set the exponential characteristic to be one. Um, the experts all know this, but I think it's a really handy trick that I wish was a standard definition. So I never had to say uh, like characteristic zero, do something different. But the first time I, uh, anyway, the, yeah, the first time I saw this, it was at one of my first conferences and I had no idea what was going on. I was wondering what an exponential field extension or like an exponential field was. Um, this was also the first time that I ever heard of uh, exceptional push forwards being referred to with shrieks. And so I was wondering why people were saying shrieks so much. And anyway, it's fun times when you go to your first conference. Um, so uh, setting E to be my exponential characteristic, I can factor any extension in terms of a separable part and the uh, inseparable part. Um, and I can write the separable part of my extension. So I've got my primitive element T, and I'm just going to write it as some power of T. It's going to be a power of the exponential characteristic uh, raised to something. And so we see that like in characteristic zero, we're always going to get a separable extension. We don't have to uh, worry about this. We would just get um, 
like this actually being my field extension. Okay, so um, the point of all of this is, so I want to factor my extension in such a way that I've got a, kind of a, a nice way of rewriting my minimal polynomial. So my minimal polynomial M, um, uh, in some sense, you can write it as a different polynomial evaluated on this power of t. So I have uh, a polynomial m that is characterized by when you evaluate it on x raised to this uh, exponent coming from my separable part of the extension then I recover the minimal polynomial M of my total extension. And the idea behind that is the uh, purely inseparable part of the extension just comes from uh, extending this all the way up to T. Um, and then uh, Morel's definition of the cohomological transfer is uh, in terms of the geometric transfer and something that you can build out of this uh, new polynomial M naught. So we take omega naught to be uh, the, uh, if I do polynomial division on M naught by this linear form, um, this is not the way that Morel defines it. He defines it in terms of like taking a derivative and evaluating in a certain way, but um, because, uh, so my minimal polynomial vanishes at T, my primitive element, the polynomial M naught is going to vanish at uh, T to the E to the I. And so that means that this is a factor of this polynomial. And so I can actually do this polynomial division and get an honest polynomial living in, uh, living over the residue field. So that's the way that I would define this uh, polynomial omega naught. And the cohomological transfer Uh, I'm going to write it kind of like the field trace, but I'm going to move the K of P just so that it like visually distinguishes it from a field trace. So it again is a map from GW over the residue field down to GW of the base. And it's a composite of before I apply the geometric transfer, I'm going to twist by omega naught evaluated at my primitive element T. So the way I think about the cohomological transfer is it's a twist of the geometric transfer. Um, and it removes kind of miraculously the dependence on T in nice cases. I won't say what those are um, in part because I didn't write them down. And if I don't write something down then I don't remember what they are generally. Um, but it's also like in the cases that one might care about, this is uh, independent of T. Um, and it, when I'm not in characteristic two, a, a really nice thing about uh, the cohomological transfer is that it's functorial along extensions, which means that I can, uh, if I want to understand a field extension that is not simple, I can break it down into simple pieces. And somehow the cohomological transfer is kind of the right way to think about this. Um, so I can uh, break things up along extensions. And as I mentioned earlier, if I have a separable extension, then the cohomological transfer is the push forward by the field trace. So you apply it, you have your bilinear form, and then you uh, post compose with your field trace. And then I also mentioned if my field extension is purely inseparable, then the cohomological transfer and the geometric transfer agree. Okay. Um, so I put an interlude here of, uh, I was gonna prove this theorem I mentioned earlier about why the local degree uh, at separable extensions, why you can write this by base changing, computing rationally and applying the field trace. Um, that comes from the cohomological transfer. I uh, see that I'm running a little short on time. So I'm gonna like very quickly sketch through this. The main thing I want you to get out of this proof sketch is that this theorem is proved using the six functor formalism. Um, 
and it somehow gives you, uh, I won't want to say like the right way to think about it, but it gives it, it's a very natural way to prove this sort of result. Um, the other results that I'm going to mention at the end are not at all proved using six functor formalism. They're uh, just kind of brute force computation. We, we give some definitions and then show that it agrees with what you would actually get by doing the computation. There are some advantages to that, but it, it doesn't give us a sense of like why the result is true or how it works in higher dimensions. So the theme of this is that I know how to do this for separable extensions. For other extensions, I don't have a six functor formalism proof of what I want to do. And in some sense, I would kind of like to have that. So this will go a little quick and then please ask questions if I'm going too quick. Um, so I'm going to let rho be the structure map uh, from spec of my residue field down to spec of my base field. And because I've assumed that this extension is separable, I get that rho is a finite at all map. So that gives me some nice things on uh, the stable homotopy categories. I get a couple of junctions. Um, of like the uh, pullback and push forward. And I also know that the push forward is equivalent to the forgetful map. Um, and then I also get an exceptional adjunction. And then I have a unit and a co-unit associated to these adjunctions. So the unit is associated to the first adjunction. And then the co-unit is associated to the exceptional adjunction. And then what I'm going to do is, so here's the uh, kind of scary diagram. The idea is, so earlier I mentioned you've got this map F bar, which looks like I take my map from affine space to affine space that sends a point P to zero. And I build kind of this local neighborhood construction and I get a quotient that looks like a sphere. Um, that's what I uh, do here, but kind of in a, or that's what I and my co-authors do here, but kind of in a categorical sense. Because my, uh, the image of my point P is rational, I get this nice sphere living here. But everywhere else, I have this uh, non-rational point. And so I don't quite have the spheres that I would like to have sitting around. I've got them smashed with uh, like the residue field. And so you kind of have to deal with this a little bit. And the solution when we were defining the local degree is you pre-compose with the collapse map. And you get this induced map here on the spheres. Uh, the A1 degree of this map is the local degree. And so the theorem comes from saying, well, if I would rather, uh, rather than computing with this, I'd rather find my base change uh, living at a rational lift of my point P. I'd like to fit this into a commutative diagram and then uh, see what I can say about it. Um, in order to have this all living in spec or in SH of K, you have to push this forward. And then these two maps here that kind of correspond in some sense to base changing these spheres in some sense. Um, they come from, well, I have to kind of worry about the sphere, but on one side, I push forward the identity map. And so this becomes a weak equivalence. And on the other side, I uh, have this co-unit. And then I conclude by a couple of theorems, one of Iwa in dimension one and Casper Lippelgren in higher dimensions, that the collapse map for separable extensions is coming directly from this unit map, which is really nice. So I can write this as uh, something smash. Uh, a unit in some sense. And then Oiwa proves that you can think about the cohomological transfer of some 
uh, form omega or some class omega. Uh, in terms of, well, you have just this composite of you start with the unit and then you have the forgetful map applied to this and then you have the co-unit. Um, and so we can, this diagram in some sense will let us write our map FP, which is going to give us our local, it's the map corresponding to the local A1 degree. We can write it in terms of uh, this base change at the rational lift and the uh, unit and the co-unit. And then because the push forward was equivalent to the forgetful map, we're able to recover the cohomological transfer here. That's that's kind of the uh, three minute version of this paper with uh, Braselton, Berkland, Montero, and OP. Um, and I don't know how to do this when I don't have the separable assumption. The separable separable assumption gives me a lot of nice uh, things to work with categorically that uh, I very quickly lose if I don't have that assumption. Um, so back to transfers. Um, the absolute transfer in my mind, so this is the, the third transfer that I'll talk about. And I'm, we started with the geometric transfer, which had a very nice geometric description of like how you build it. And then you say, well, it depends on T. I want to remove that dependence on the primitive element. And so then I define the cohomological transfer. And then the cohomological transfer has this nice functorial property. And so you ask like, how much of that is lost uh, in the absolute, or like how much of that is lost in the geometric setting? So you say how non-functorial is the geometric transfer? So if I had some extension that I've factored my uh, geometric transfer into, or if I, in other words, take some extension and I look at a composite of geometric transfers along that extension. And at each step, I have some choice of primitive element. Um, it turns out that this only depends on uh, the wedge product of differentials of those primitive elements living in this cotangent uh, complex or like the determinant of the cotangent. Um, and so Morel's definition of the absolute transfer is to say, well, if it only depends on this, uh, this differential form, then I'm just going to twist that away in a sense. Um, and this is uh, another place where I'm gonna wave my hands to save some time, but you can twist your growth and bit group by this uh, cotangent space. And it turns out that it's like in the separable case, this is just isomorphic. So this is like a, a rank one vector space and it's got kind of a canonical untwisting. Um, but the catchphrase that I want you to remember is that the cohomological transfer is equal to the absolute transfer uh, precomposed with a twist. So sort of how we define the um, the, the cohomological transfer to be a geometric transfer with a twist. We're going to do the same. Uh, the absolute transfer with a twist gives us a, a different twist, gives us a cohomological transfer. Um, so I'm almost at the dimension one results that I want to mention, but the two things I want to say here are, uh, so in some sense, the absolute transfer is the transfer we get by pre-composing with the collapse map. So the collapse map allows me to take uh, endomorphisms from this quotient space to the sphere to endomorphisms of the sphere. So Morel tells me that this is GW of K. A little bit of work tells me that this is just the twist of GW of K. 
And then yeah, I have the absolute transfer in here. And the lemma that uh, Thomas Braselton and I prove is that this is a commutative diagram that you can uh, make sense of. So you can think of uh, this being like a, an algebraic description of using the collapse map to transfer down. Um, we proved this, this, I don't know if this is in the literature anywhere, but it seems like something that people knew or expected in some sense, um, but we couldn't find a reference, so we gave a proof. Um, and then the next thing we prove is kind of going backwards in a sense in the, uh, if you ask like, why should we expect to always be able to do this thing that I'm uh, wanting to do? I want to compute uh, local degrees by base changing to the rational case, working rationally and then transferring back down. Why should one expect that that is always possible? Well, we do kind of a similar uh, diagram building exercise where we uh, we look at so this is the these are the sorts of maps that show up when I'm uh, computing a local degree at a non-rational point, and you have an isomorphism with this twisted Rothenik bit space, and if you use the untwisting. Uh, where, where it's defined, you can actually recover this by an isomorphism in terms of like we do all of this in the six functor formalism by working in some, in some setting the uh, KP rational like sphere uh, so what to say about this diagram? Over here, I've got maps from this cofiber where the point that I've removed is not rational. And I'm living over K in the side. And then over here, I've kind of rewritten it. Um, and now I'm looking at uh, endomorphisms of this, kind of, or like maps of this cofiber, but now I'm working at a rational point. Um, and so in some setting, or in some sense, this tells me that I should be able to like kind of untwist the absolute transfer and uh, actually work KP rationally and then transfer back down. So that's kind of the uh, upshot here is that if I start with a map F defined over K, then I'm expecting, so I, I get, this map kind of on the left-hand side of the diagram. And it satisfies using the collapse map being the absolute transfer, that the absolute transfer of this map is the local A1 degree. And so it looks like I should get some different map tilde living on the right side of the diagram And since this came from an untwisting, um, I should be able to recover my local degree by working with this rational map and applying the cohomological transfer. And so then the question is just um, like, what is F tilde? I have some diagram arguing that it exists, but what is it? Um, so this is what I mean by a lift, is, is there a lift G to living over the residue field KP of F? So I want this to vanish at some lift of my point. Uh, and I want, when I do this bar construction here, I want it to recover GW tilde. And in, in some sense, is there some uh, KP rational map such that I can compute the local degree of F at P by working rationally with G? And then I'm thinking, well, the cohomological transfer of G bar looks like F bar in some sense. <laughs> 
So this is the question of, can I lift my map, work rationally and transfer back down? Um, and in just the last couple of minutes, I'll just- um, Do you mean by this question that if you have something algebraic, you want to, I mean, do you want to produce some algebraic map? Yeah, we'd like something algebraic. Um, right, so the kind of the-, the um, I guess you have from abstract nonsense, you have all this stuff. I mean, up to what, right? Yeah, so we, we yeah, the, the, this is a good point that, like, the absolute transfer in this kind of diagram chase shows us that it exists. But the question is, can we actually get our hands on it? Can we say something explicit about it? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the reason that I, like, I would like to be able to say something explicit is because we can actually do that in the separable case. So that theorem that I was talking about earlier just says that G is the base change. That's like the nice algebraic description of what this map looks like in the separable case. Um, earlier, I mentioned that like the geometric transfer is not going to work well. I'll kind of skip this exercise, but this is, we talked about this earlier that in the purely inseparable setting, the rank of, uh, so like this is the simplest purely inseparable extension I can think of. Um, is given by x to the p minus t living over fp adjoint t. Um, this is rank p uh, when I work downstairs, so when I just compute the local degree. But if I base change, compute rationally, and apply the Charlotte trace or the geometric transfer, then I get rank p squared. So something goes wrong, and this, as you uh, spotted, Alexi, is completely due to nil potents. You get some singular behavior that you didn't want. Um, the nice thing about dimension one, which is where Thomas and I wrote this paper, is you can just brute force compute things. So the idea is I'm going to just say what the two lifts should be associated to the geometric transfer and the cohomological transfer. And then you just compute that it works. So um, I'm going to. So given a map in dimension one that vanishes at a point P, uh, if, so if uh, T is a primitive element of the uh, extension, then the minimal polynomial of that corresponds to the point P at which we're vanishing. Um, and that means that in dimension one, I can factor my polynomial really nicely. I've got this unit, this does not vanish at my point P, and then I vanish at my point P with some multiplicity D. So the geometric lift is I just take that unit, I leave that unit alone, but I'm going to replace the minimal polynomial with x minus t to the d power. This is defined over my residue field. So in a sense, this is, I want to ignore all of the factors of my minimal polynomial that are not the, the point at which I'm, like the, my choice of lift. But in the inseparable case, you might lift to the same thing multiple times. And so I just want to ignore all those extra lifts. That's the motivation behind this. Um, and then the cohomological transfer, or the cohomological lift. I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to scale it by this omega naught that came from when we were defining the cohomological transfer. So that was just this m naught over x minus t to the e to the i. And then using um, the Bayesian description, we just brute force compute that if you apply the uh, geometric transfer to the local degree computed rationally of the geometric lift, then you get the local degree. And the same thing for the cohomological transfer. If you take the cohomological lift and then apply the cohomological transfer, you recover your local degree. So for two transfers, we know how to lift. Um, 
And one pro to mention is that it looks like this theorem uh, holds unstably. I'll just kind of leave that as a tantalizing uh, remarks. So Kazanov has this extra information about what the A1 degree looks like in dimension one. And if you had a transfer in the unstable setting, if you had transfers in dimension one, um, which uh, Christian Wickelgren and I are thinking about right now, then uh, our proof, like since it's just brute force computation, you can you get a presentation of the bilinear form, you can take its determinant and it gives you what you would expect out of a determinant for like a, an unstable transfer map. So if the theory of unstable transfers ends up working out and making sense, then this result would hold unstably. Um, and the six functor formalism proof would not see that because the six functor formalism lives in the stable category. And so it's not gonna see any of this unstable phenomenon. Um, but there are a lot of cons to the like brute force approach. There's no obvious way to generalize to higher dimensions. Um, <clears throat> it kind of feels ad hoc, like the definitions of these lists. It's just kind of looking at the transfers and saying, well, what should we do to fix it? Um, and depending on your taste, it's a computational proof instead of a conceptual proof, conceptual proof. So that's kind of where I'd like to end with the open questions are like, how do we do this in higher dimensions? Um, so can you define these? For uh, n greater than one. You don't have this nice factorization living around anymore, and so that becomes a little more difficult. Um, and then also, like, can you give these definitions and proofs in terms of the six functor formulas? So, let's say minus six functors. So, that is where I'll end. Thank you for your time and attention.